Well, we're in Romans chapter 12, and uh, I've been gone for two weeks, and so I forgot everything that I'd said two weeks ago. In fact, I forgot a lot of stuff in two weeks. Um, I wanted to just uh, refresh you a little bit. We, have, we were looking at what happens to someone, what happens to a person who has been acquitted of all of their crimes against the holy God. What do they do? What does a person do who has been, sins have been taken away and removed? We looked at a couple weeks ago with Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah said, Lord, here I am, send me. They say what he says. That's what happens when believers consider the mercies of God in their lives. They offer themselves as living sacrifices. They offer themselves so that their lives don't even matter anymore. The only thing that matters to them is that God will be honored and pleased in their lives through their holiness and through their minds. They offer themselves up to him. And subsequently, because of that, they offer themselves up to serve the body of Christ using the various gifts that he has given them to serve the body of Christ. That's what we're studying today in Romans. We'll be studying that whole concept maybe in a two or three more weeks because it's going to take us a while to get through all of it. This is what we looked at last time, verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Basically what I just said a while ago, because uh, every gift and every advantage, everything, every place, everything that you have in this life is something that God has done for us, something that God himself has done for you only by his grace. You have not merited, you have not earned anything that makes you better or, or anything. And because it's all by his grace, because it's all by his mercy, because he has done it, overwhelmingly and abundantly so, giving you all these mercies, there's no reason for anyone to think that they're better than anyone else. You can't come with a braggadocious attitude of conceit. You can't even come with a false attitude, of, a false humility, so you can fish for compliments to make yourself feel better. Because you don't really need to feel better. You have grace. So don't overestimate yourself and don't devalue and underestimate and undervalue others who have different gifts than you do. You do. If you have a great gift, awesome. But don't think of yourself as something because you have it and don't think of someone else as less because they don't have it. Theirs is different than yours. Oh, you must have the gift of mercy. Poor soul. That is a poor soul. Instead, you have to think of yourself with a sane mind. You have to evaluate your gift and how you use that gift so that it benefits others with a sane mind. Not to be insane, but sane. That's what we looked at. That's what that verse means. Think of yourself with sober judgment, sanity. You are not superior to anyone else. No one in this body in this church, or anywhere else in all of Christendom, anyone else who's ever been saved and received God's mercy is better than anyone else who got saved and received God's mercy. All of them deserve, all of you deserve, I deserve eternal damnation. But we don't get that, we get mercy. And we get gifts. Each one of us has been given a gift to serve each other, to build each other up, to grow each other, to strengthen each other. In Christ Jesus. That's what this is about today. I'm going to say all this same stuff many, many more times. Same thing. This is what the gifts are for. To build each other up. To edify each other. To serve each other. To grow each other. Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7. Now to each one, each single member of the, of the body of Christ, each single member of the church, each single person who has been redeemed by the blood of Christ... Each one, the manifestation of the Spirit, spiritual gift, is given for the common good. I'll explain that later. And we'll be switching over to 1 Corinthians quite a bit too because it parallels what Paul says in Romans chapter 12 too about spiritual gifts. Peter says it in 1 Peter 4.10, Each one, each one of you, 
every single one, no exceptions, should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. He means that you and I have been given gifts to serve. That's what this is all about. That's where we're going with this. I'm going to push your button. You've been given a gift to serve God by serving his people in his church, his body. God has equipped every single one of his people with something special and unique so that he can serve other people in the church for their benefit, for their blessing, for their joy, for their gladness. That's what, it's, that's what they're for. It's about the church serving the church making the church function. So let's pick up there and see how far we can get today. Uh, chapter 12, Romans, verse 4 and 5. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Paul uses this analogy to illustrate his point. And while this is an analogy to show that there are many varieties of gifts in the church that function in many different ways, he uses this analogy mainly to give us this understanding of something totally different, the church. The analogy is given to illustrate and demonstrate the varieties in the church and the way the church is supposed to function and be used. It's of the church. Verse 4, But just as each one of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. He's talking about a physical body. Each one of us here has a physical body. And that physical body is not made up of just a bunch of uh, parts, glob of pieces that somehow fit together, attached in various places, and that each one of those parts is independent of all the others. That's not what your body is. Your body is basically an organic unity. One body. Your body is an organic whole. It's not an organization of parts. It's a unified organism. Your body is, is one organism. And it's all connected. All connected, not just uh, randomly and haphazardly, but it's connected to form this one thing, this one unit, this one body. All the parts are for one body. And that one thing, that one body, that unity... It's comprised, Paul says, of many members. The word members is just a word that means body parts. Same word used in uh, where Jesus said, if your right eye causes you to sin, cut it out. What good is it if you go to uh, live your whole life with uh, all sound, but I lost it. You have to have, what good is it if you have all your body parts and still go to hell? That text. Should have written it down. Without trying to know anything about anatomy here, because I don't, we have a body, we have a head, we have a torso, we have arms and legs, I have hands and feet, I have fingers and toes, I have a face with two eyes, a nose and ears, I have a mouth, we have all these systems. You want, to get, you want to blow your mind? Go learn about the human anatomy and all the systems, the nervous system, the circulatory system, the respiratory system, the digestive system, the skeleton, the muscles, all the other stuff, the skin, the hair, the reproductive system, the hormones, the immune system, the urinary system. I don't want to talk about that. Don't forget all the genetics, too. I hadn't even gotten into the cells yet. That's just all the parts. Very complex, a whole variety of parts. Now, I don't think Paul intends to say, and of course, I don't think they knew all that stuff back then, so he certainly doesn't intend to say that every single detail of the human body is supposed to, supposed to correspond with somebody in the church. Not necessarily. I don't want to say that. But the body is not supposed to be an exact equivalent to every spiritual gift. Here's the thing about those parts in the body. None of them do the same thing. They do not have the same function, the text says. It's a Greek word, praxis. 
they use that word in English too. It means to practice, to be practical. We get those words from that word. It means to act, to have a task, to do a task. To ha- it is a task. Every member has a different function. Every member of the body has a different task. Every member of the body does something different. It acts its own way and does not act the same as all the other ones. They do different things. This organized, unified body has great diversity and great variety in the way it acts and the way it performs. That's the illustration that Paul is making here. He says the same illustration in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. The body is a unit. Though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. 1 Corinthians 12, 14. Now the body is not made up of one part, but many. And he talks about the foot. He talks about the hand. He talks about the ear. He talks about the eye. He talks about your nose having a sense of smell. All in that text right there. So he even breaks it down in a few more details to illustrate that every part has something different to do. Verse 20, there, as it is, there are many parts but one body. And how many times can you say the same thing? One body, many parts. All the parts function differently and do different things. They have different tasks, different acts. Even the talking about the apparent um, visibilities of the different parts what you can see and what you can't see. Uh, Verse 22 through 24, chapter 12, 1 Corinthians. Those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And these parts that are uh, unrepresentable are treated with special modesty, while the presentable parts need no special treatment. Like, there are some parts of the body, some gifts in the body that you don't need to say anything about. And some you need to honor. Because you don't ever see them. But they're working. They're doing things. There is great variety in your body. And each body part performs a unique and important function. Even the ones you don't see or hear about. That's the physical body. That's the illustration. Now, what do you call a body when one of the parts of the body, whatever that part is, name it, pick one. Any part. Pick any part of the body that you want to pick, and when that body part doesn't work, what do you call that? You call that disease. You call that uh, a disorder, a deformity, a defect, a weakness, a deficiency, an injury. You call that AB normal. People right there got that. It's abnormal. Anytime you have a body and one of the parts is not doing what it's supposed to be doing, something abnormal is going on, you have a disease. Sometimes that disease is very uh, uh, painful, causing great discomfort. Sometimes the pain is so painful, it's debilitating. You can't do anything else because of the pain you're having because one of your body parts isn't doing right. Bad. And sometimes you manage to function, but you limp. Sometimes you manage to, to make it through and get through the day and be okay, but it's not fun. It causes all kinds of failures when there's a glitch in the unity of the system. All kinds of discomforts when one of the parts is misfiring and not working properly. And then you have the problem that we had last time uh, in the sermon Whenever one of the parts isn't working right, then other parts have to step in and try to fill that void. And when the other parts step in to fill that void, they start to get a little bit proud and start going, well, look at us. We do ten things. And then you have to tell them to calm down. Stop thinking more highly than you ought. Just because one of the body parts isn't working right, Paul says in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 26, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. It's also similar whenever one of the body parts takes off on its own and works independently. You have all kinds of other diseases that happen because of that. Or everybody everybody in the body trying, every part of the body trying to do the same thing. 
It's messed up. You end up with deformity. You end up with confusion. You end up with chaos. No, the parts of the body are meant to function and work together as a whole. It's so much so that when the, that when the, body, is, uh, when the body is running smoothly and there are no glitches, you don't even think about it. The body, all the parts are working so good that the body is in good shape and you don't even think about what might be wrong with the body. But the minute one of the parts stops working, then you see the glitches and the holes and the problems in the body. Something is wrong with the body and it's not working right. That's the analogy Paul is making here. And Paul is only making that analogy of the physical body and the parts to illustrate this, the church. He's talking about the church. He's talking about not your physical body and how it's supposed to function, but how the church is supposed to function. How each of us is supposed to serve the church using the different spiritual gifts God has given us. That's what he says in verse 5. So in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. So... Just like a body. So, just like a physical body. So, just like the body that you live in. Spiritual gifts only make sense in the context of the church. They're not meant for anything else except the church. And they don't make any sense in any other context except the church. Spiritual gifts are only for the church. And I want to spend the rest of the time today, uh, I might try to chase a rabbit or two and deal with this issue, this doctrine, this very important doctrine, one that we have to understand so that we can minimize and avoid confusion that we will have about verses like this. What is the church? Paul's teaching about the church. Paul is teaching us about the church. We studied this in depth a few back in October on Wednesday nights. Um, we're studying doctrine. We got the doctrine of the church, and we deal with this. And I just want to give you a very brief, super condensed version of what we did then. Because the New Testament refers to the church several different ways. It's uh, several images are, are used to describe the church, several metaphors to talk about the church. It's the people of God. The church is the family of God. The church is God's household. The church is God's building. The church is God's temple. The church is a royal priesthood. The church is the bride of Christ. The church is the flock of God, the little sheep. All those images are used to describe the church in the New Testament. That is what we are, all of those things. But here in Romans 12, we are the body of Christ. We're the body. In Christ, in Christ we are his body. Through faith in him, coming to him and looking to what he did when he died for us on the cross and gave his life as a substitute for us so that he would pay for our sins and take him away from us, those of us who have looked to him and trusted him and believed him for that are his body. We who are many people, with all different kinds of styles, all different classes, all different kinds of weird, quirky personalities, all different talents, all different kinds of skills, all different kinds of gifts, and particularly gifts. Because your personality is what you're born with. You're weird already. Your gift is something God gave you. We're the body of Christ. We're one body. And by that he means Christ's body. We are Christ's body. We are his body. His church. Paul says the same thing, 1 Corinthians 12. I uh, read it a while ago. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. This body analogy is about the church. It's about being united to Christ and being in Him. Together. All of us together comprise and make up His body. The church is not a human institution and man-made organization. The church is a God-made 
union of people who are all in Christ. He made them, and he brought them to him, his son, and he drew them to faith in him, and they believed him, and he made them his body. That's what the church is. It's called his body. And he is the head. Let me just read all the verses that says it. If I miss some, I don't, I don't know where they are. Ephesians 5, 23, the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, which he is the Savior. Colossians 1, 18, he is the head of the body, the church. Ephesians 4, 15 and 16, instead speaking the truth in love, we will, we will with, in all things grow up in him who is the head, that is Christ, and in him the whole body Joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. He's the head of the whole body. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Christ is the head. The church is the body, his body. Colossians 2, 19, he has lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. We are the body, Christ is the head. He is the head. He rules, he directs, he controls. The body is what Christ, Christ is the Lord of the body and the, he tells the body how to live and what to do. And that's, that's the church. We're not talking about individual Christians here. We're talking about the church. He is Lord of the church. And we are to submit to his lordship and authority as a church. And he's given us spiritual gifts under his headship for the body to function properly. In harmony and in unity, together. Like I said, the illustration goes... If there's one part of the body not working right, you have a disease. And in Christ, in the church, if one of the members of the church, if one of the parts of the body is not working right, they have a disease in the church. You have a pain, you have an ailment, you have a deformity, a malfunction. It functions properly under his control when he is the head and we submit to him. Now, I want to keep going for just a little bit more about this doctrine of the church. It's very critical. It's very essential. It's essential to our Christian faith, this biblical view of the church. Because I think a lot of people miss it, and they get confused about it. And because they're confused about it, they don't ever do what they're supposed to do in the church. The New Testament uses the word church in two primary dominant ways are two ways in the New Testament. One of them is dominant. One of them is used way more than the other one. And it is the main meaning of the word church in the New Testament. I'll give it to you. It means the local assembly of, or the specific city or region where believers gather. That is the meaning of the church in the New Testament. A local assembly of specific city in a specific city or region referring to all the believers of Christ, in Christ in that city where someone might, where they might meet together in a place at a rented facility or even someone's house. That's the dominant word, the dominant meaning for the word church in the New Testament. I'll give you some places. 1 Corinthians 1, 2. And this is in all of Paul's letters. To the church of God in Corinth. Is he writing to the whole church or just one church? He's writing to this one local church in Corinth. Galatians 1 and 2, Paul, an apostle, to the churches in Galatia. Galatia is this region, and there are various local independent churches in that area. He's writing to them, local churches. 1 Corinthians 4, 17, Timothy will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. I teach the same things everywhere I go to every church I go to every local assembly where the believers gather. That church. 
1 Corinthians 16, 19. The churches in the province of Asia send you greetings. It's very similar to the churches in Galatia, except this is in Asia, another region. They send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord, and so does the church that meets at their house. You have a church that meets at Priscilla and Aquila's house. Called the church. Colossians 4.15, give, give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. A lady named Nympha has a church, meets in her house, in the living room. I don't know how many people pack it in, but it's a church in her house. A local church. Paul writes to Philemon, verses 1 and 2. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear f- friend and fellow worker to Apphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. The dominant meaning, the main meaning, the, the primary meaning that the word church is used in the New Testament is to refer to a local assembly in a region or a city or even in someone's home. Now, there is another meaning for the word church, and it's very important too. Don't think I'm not trying to discount this one because this is way up there. It's just not as common. It's not as dominant in the way the word is used in the New Testament. It's the universal church. The universal church is all the redeemed of all the ages in all the places that ever was. Where there ever were Christians, there was the church. Ever. All of them. All over the place, any city, any country, any age. All the redeemed of all the times, of all the places. That's the universal church. And that's used about a dozen times in the New Testament. One of them is uh, Matthew 16, 18. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. He's not talking about a local church. He's talking about the whole church. All the redeemed of all the ages, of all the places. Colossians 1.24, Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. He doesn't mean just one local church. He means the whole church. Of all the redeemed, of all the ages, of all the places. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. He's talking about the church for all generations. This universal church of all the redeemed, of all the places, of all the times, ever, ever in the whole world. The universal church. Now those are the two meanings of the word church in the New Testament. The main one, the one that's used the most, is the idea of the local church. I'll give you a good, uh, a good example of that. The, local, the universal church is there. It's all of Christ's people, ever. But that, lo- that universal church is really, truly, only made manifest, only made visible, where? How would you ever know that there's such a thing as a universal church? If what? If not for what? There were a local church somewhere where you could walk in and meet some of those people. The universal church is made visible in a local church. You wouldn't even know there was a church out there except every once in a while you pop up and meet a Christian out in the mall or somewhere or at work but you want to meet a bunch of them, go to a local church. There's the church. Go to a church where they are assembled. They are assembled and gathered and are worshiping together and fellowshipping together and all the things that the church is supposed to be and do together. It's in the local church. That's the main meaning of the word church in the New Testament. It is. And Paul's point is, that all the members of that church, all the members of Christ's body, all the church, are mutually connected and dependent on each other. No one is isolated. No one is allowed to be isolated, either on their own or by someone else. 
you're in a local church, you're not allowed to be isolated. You're not allowed to go off on your own. You're not allowed to be set apart. You are one of us. That's why Paul says, members of one another. Each belongs to all the others. You're mine, and I'm yours. I need you, and you need me. I need you, you need me. You're mine, I'm yours. That's what it means. All are members of one another. Now, I want to ask a question. I want to see if I can figure this out. How, do you, how does that flesh out and relate to spiritual gifts? Because this is what comes into my mind. I've already given you the distinction between a local church and the universal church. And I believe that the dominant meaning for the church in the New Testament is the local church. And the local church is an assembly, a body of gathered believers who come together in a place, in a home, in a city, somewhere where they meet and gather. How does that relate to spiritual gifts? I'll say this. I believe that it's conceivable, and I believe it's very possible, and it's even likely that you can exercise your spiritual gift, whatever that gift is, we'll figure that out in the weeks to come, whatever your gift is, it's conceivable and possible and likely that you can exercise that gift in the universal church. You will. In fact, I believe you should. As often as the opportunity allows you to take your gift and use it to bless other believers somewhere. Even if you meet them in the mall or they work with them or something like that. Now, all don't go to the same local church. If you have some of these gifts, they can easily and readily be used to build up and bless and benefit believers all over the place. I'll tell you this. Surely, if you have the gift of mercy, oh, you must have the gift of mercy. If you have the gift of mercy, I'll bet you you'll run into people and find people in who are in Christ, who are other believers who need mercy, and there you are, bam. You can be merciful, and not just be merciful, but use your gift of mercy to bless them, encourage them, strengthen them. If you have the gift of encouragement, you can use it with any believer anywhere to encourage them. In fact, that very principle is probably applicable to most of the spiritual gifts. If you have a spiritual gift, it's likely, it's conceivable, it's possible, and it's, you should do it and use it to bless any Christian you can, anywhere you can, anytime you can. Universal church, application of spiritual gifts. Even believers you might not even know very well. True story, I believe that. But I believe that the function of the gifts are meant to work together as a whole in the context of of guess where? The local church. Here. Here. You're supposed to use your gifts here. In this place. In this context. Sure, if you have the gift of giving, you can use that money that you have that God wants you to give to people. You can use that to bless all kinds of people and Christians all over the place. But if you don't give here, we don't pay the bills and we shut down. You have to use your spiritual gifts here in this local church. We can't pay the bills without it. If you have the gift of encouragement, I'm going to promise you right now, I need you to encourage me. Not somebody else on the other side of town. Here. Here. This place, I want you to take care of my babies. I want you to vacuum my floors. I want you to share your wisdom with us. I want you to clean our kitchen. Whatever the spiritual gift that you have is, it works in the local church. There are some gifts that, that are listed that we're going to look at that can only be used in a local church. You couldn't use it in the universal church ever. I'll tell you, I'll give you an example. Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. 
talking about spiritual gifts again, it was he who gave some to be apostles. He gave gifts to men. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and look at this, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. The body of Christ in each place has a what? A pastor. Paul writes to the Ephesians, uh, told the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, this is probably three or four years earlier before he wrote the book of Romans. But he re- I just read the letter that he wrote to the Ephesians. This is what he said to them in person three or four years earlier than this. He said to the elders of Ephesus, he says, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. You can't just show up at the universal church and say, hey, I'm ready to be your pastor. I got pastor gifts over here. Universal church, look, I'm here to be your pastor. You can't just show up at the universal church and claim you have the spiritual gift of shepherd or overseer. Not just the office, but the gift. He's talking to the elders of the church, where? In Ephesus. Be shepherds of the church of the flock to which the Holy Spirit made you overseers. Your local church, the one in Ephesus. You don't just, same thing with teaching, you don't just show up and start teaching, do you? Hey, I've got the gift of teaching, I'm going to show up in just any, any place, any universal church out there, I'm just going to show up and start teaching, right? Does that make any sense to you? No, those kinds of gifts need to be confirmed by the church where you attend, where you are, where you exist, where you live, where you worship, where you fellowship, your church. The one you call your church. Now, this is another reason why I believe uh, in uh, church membership. I believe it's a solid biblical assumption that you're to be a member of a local church so you can plug in and use your gifts and they can test you. And they can say, that dude really is a good pastor. That dude really is a good teacher. That, that person is doing his gift in this context. And he's not a heretic. That's not my main reason either. That's like my third reason. My first two reasons are Um, mutual accountability to each other and accountability to the biblical authority of the leadership of that church. Those are the two main things we learned that when we studied, when we did the list matters. But here's a subsequent one. Your spiritual gifts. They cry out, cry out. Uh, They assume that there is a membership in a local church. So you can plug in and use your gift in that church, in that local church where you belong. Speaking of leaders, said leadership, right? That's a gift too, right? Leadership. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. And in the church, God has appointed those with the gift of administration. Let's get back up to verse 12, Romans 12, 8. If it's leadership, let him govern diligently. Now, how do you administrate? How do you lead the universal church? Anybody? anybody I would love to hear some brilliant ideas on how you administrate the universal church. How do you do that? How do you, how do you lead and administrate uh, the universal church? If that's your gift. No, it's the local church, the local congregation, the local manifestation of the body of Christ where you covenant to belong, where you're on that list, where you're the one who holds everybody else accountable and they hold you accountable. You hold them accountable, they hold you accountable. You, you tell them they have to live like Christ, they tell you you have to live like Christ. That church, that's where the gift of administration, the gift of leadership lives and works. That's the context of where using spiritual gifts really even means something. Truly. I don't know how you would administrate the universal church. I don't know how to do it. 
So that's what spiritual gifts are. It's God working to make us function well in a local church with unity and harmony where we all go away strengthened in the faith, built up, unified, changed because all of us were together using our gifts. In fact, that's what Paul says. 1 Corinthians 12, 12, 7. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Common good is a word that means to be, made, to be of an advantage to someone. To be advantageous, to be better off, to be someone's advantage. Your spiritual gift is for you to plug into a local church and be an advantage to somebody else, to benefit them, to bless them. Everyone else's advantage, not yours, theirs. To make everyone else better off because they got to hang with you at church on Sunday or Wednesday or wherever you met in the local context. The reason God has given us spiritual gifts is so that we will use it to make everyone else profit spiritually. Everyone else profits from you being there. Because you use your gift. It's for those who've gathered in each church, in each city, in each home, in each location, in each rented building, in each place where they can put chairs and sit and listen and, and be church. And when one of you is absent, when one of you is not working and not doing it, not using it, not plugged into it, when one of you is not serving with a full commitment to the fellowship, guess what the rest of us are not? We're not built up. We're not encouraged. We're not strengthened. We have a disease. I hate saying that. I don't like when preachers say stuff like that. But that's what spiritual gifts are for. So you function well and you don't have any diseases. And everybody's plugged in. And everybody's working. And everybody's doing it. And nobody's absent. No one's missing. I read this one earlier. Uh, Ephesians 4, 16. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love. The whole body grows and builds itself up in love as each part, as each part does its work. As every single person discovers and uses and takes their gift and plugs it into that local church, everybody else is built up. Everybody else is growing. Everybody else is strengthened. There's so much, so much here. We'll keep going next time. Let's pray. Father God, we are grateful for your word. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be able to proclaim it. Lord, I pray that you've been honored and pleased. I pray that your spirit has uh, touched all of our lives today. You've changed us, convicted us, brought us into a place where we uh, will uh, serve, use our gifts, plug in, get connected, use it so all of us are strengthened. I pray that for myself. Father, we love you and we thank you for your word. Pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.